Hi there everyone, I hope that you're doing well. Um, this is your recording for Unit 4 and we're going to be talking about uh, the philosophy of sex and sexuality with Leslie Feinberg. So before I get into it, I want to sort of explain the rationale for this last unit because I think that in many ways it can you know, maybe seem a little bit out of touch or out of sync, perhaps, with what we've done with the rest of the course, right? And that's primarily because we're going to be investigating concepts relating to gender, sex, and sexuality and thinking about their relationship to the philosophical topics that we've discussed up to this point. And now the reason why I wanted to end the class in this way, you know, we began obviously going through that whole, um, you know, narrative of Socrates, right? The trial and death of Socrates. And we got immersed in some classical philosophy, right? With the Dogen and the uh, Epicurus, right? And then we began to sort of investigate some, some kind of political interventions that are nonetheless still very clearly philosophical, right? Uh, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, right? I think that part of the reason why a lot of people's responses for week two were so good and so interesting for me to read, which I appreciate, by the way, um, is because you all were able to take the sort of direct contrast between what Plato or Socrates was saying in the Crido and what Martin Luther King Jr. was saying in the letter from a Birmingham jail, right? And then we've continued to move forward with some um, classical, but nonetheless still political works and philosophy examining, you know, Karl Marx and John Paul Sartre and Patricia Hill Collins, right? And one thing that I think that the sum of those readings allows us to kind of understand are the ways in which you know, oppression and injustice sort of take away, or at least appear to take away from the possibility of living a good life, right? And this is, you know, part of the basis of uh, Martin Luther King's um, objection to Socrates' decision in the Crido, right? Is that you cannot simply like choose to be a victim of injustice because this allows such injustice to fester, right? And that genuinely impedes people's ability to live out a good life, right? And so the philosopher is someone who's concerned with, uh, you know, allowing people to reach enlightenment and wisdom, right? Should be concerned with the well-being of others, right? And so the investigations that we're taking into the philosophy of sex and sexuality primarily sort of like follow this uh, line of inquiry, right? And we're just taking it to a much more contemporary set of theoretical tools, right? We're going to be talking about some older stuff such as psychoanalysis in the next video and very, very, you know, um, 20th century, but nonetheless very classical pieces of philosophy and Michel Foucault. Foucault is a very interesting figure. He's actually one of the most cited um, sources like ever, right? Um, and so it'll be good for us to get some familiarity with some of his uh, basic ideas and themes. But, and then especially in this video, we're going to be talking about sort of the origins of trans theory, right? And so we're going to look at Leslie Feinberg, and they were a transgender activist in the 90s. We're looking at one of their speeches, right, in the same way that we looked at the letter from a Birmingham jail or the existentialism is a humanism speech, right? And we're going to try to examine the philosophical content that we can find um, in this speech, right? Okay, and so Leslie Feinberg uh, is an activist, right? And so 
in general, you know, taking from the Patricia Collins that we read last week, philosophy of gender, sex, and sexuality should is best understood as a kind of critical social theory, right? So it's a social theory insofar as it's giving an account of a kind of societal structure, right? And it's a critical social theory because it intends not only to describe that structure, right, but also to make uh, movements towards changing that structure, right? It has a sort of activist um, bent or orientation to it, right? And this is what's going to separate, you know, a lot of what um, philosophers call critical theory from what you might encounter in other disciplines such as political science, right? You know, it's one thing to sort of look at a government and describe what it's doing when it's functional, right? Which is maybe like how you could describe what a lot of political science does, right? Uh, but then you could also choose to describe something with an orientation towards changing it in some significant way, right? Okay, and so one thing to note about the field of philosophy of gender, sex, and sexuality that we're going to be investigating is that this field is highly interdisciplinary, right? And part of the reason why I wanted to give you um, this unit at the end of this course is because it is very common nowadays to kind of have a like philosophy of such and such um, sort of class, right? And this obviously sort of falls into um, that line of thinking, right? And so you can have, um, you know, uh, philosophy of science, right? And then even furthermore, you know, you can have the philosophy of biology versus the philosophy of physics, right? Um, similar fields are like philosophy of mathematics, right? And so you can kind of see that since philosophy is essentially like, you know, a sort of questioning approach to fundamental concepts, right, that you can apply that method <laughs> in various kinds of domains. So you can ask, like, what are the fundamental questions or concepts or types of explanation or whatever that occur in scientific inquiry and how is it related to our knowledge, right? And then similarly, you know, you can have these more um, immediately political sort of questions, right? Like about gender, sex, and sexuality. But it's important to emphasize that um, all of these fields are essentially highly interdisciplinary, right? And so, you know, a lot of um, philosophy of sex and sexuality or philosophy of gender, sex and sexuality is going to um, not only focus on philosophical stuff about right and wrong, right? But maybe also be able to have at least familiarity with a biological account of what sex is. Right. And to be able to discuss sort of how, you know, like the history of, uh, you know, developments of biology in the 20th century led to different concepts related to sex and sexuality. Right. Think about, for example, hormones. Right. The discovery of endocrinology, which is, you know, the science of medicine having to do with hormones. Um, in the early 20th century radically changed our own conception of what sex was, right? Because now we have the concept of sex hormones. Um, and so, you know, that just sort of gives you a little bit of a taste for how these developments that happen in biology or medicine or wherever else can have an enormous implication for our social conceptions of gender, sex, and sexuality, right? And then to also, you know, we should mention psychology, right? And psychiatry as domains in which um, there is a running commentary on uh, gender, sex, and sexuality, right? But psychiatry is not a critical social theory, right? 
Psychiatry is a discipline that is about healing individuals, right? Rendering individuals functional within the kind of society that we live in, right? Its tools, its methods, its conceptual toolkit, right? Is not aimed at changing society. It's aimed at healing individuals, right? And so we can kind of see how these different perspectives on gender, sex, and sexuality can lead to different points of view. Like for a long time, you know, being uh, gay or being queer was listed in the um, DSM as mental illness, right? And similarly with, um, you know, what I believe is now termed gender identity disorder, right? Which is how... Um, the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is sort of like the, the Bible uh, for psychiatry, that's how they tend to think about these kinds of concepts, right? And so often if you're taking the sort of approach from a critical social theory, then you have some level of antagonism towards disciplines that are sort of intended to work with the existing society, right? And fulfill some sort of function within, right? Because they have contrary conceptions of, uh, you know, the, uh, queerness or being trans, etc. right? Okay, and so the central questions that we're going to try to ask both throughout this video and the next video are these three, right? So how did our prevailing contemporary notions of sex and sexuality emerge right so like what um you know where where does that come from right and you can see this obviously has a a, a historical sort of bent to it as well right and so what is the political function of this regime so in other words what do you so, so like what do our concepts of gender and sexuality do in terms of our thinking about justice, right? And then finally, how do these concepts relate to our conception of the good life, right? And so in this video, we're going to primarily address this third question, which is how do these concepts of gender, sex, and sexuality sort of relate to the possibility of living a genuinely fulfilling kind of life, right? And in the next video on Freud and Foucault, we're going to be discussing more how our prevailing notions of sex and sexuality emerge and um, the political function of them. Although we're going to be talking about some um, political stuff uh, today here as well, right? Okay, so to start us off, Leslie Fine, right? Leslie Feinberg was a transgender activist from the 90s. The speech that we read together tries to outline sort of like the rudiments of a sort of transgender liberation movement, right? And an accompanying sort of like transgender theory, right? So like, wh what is your account of how and why the oppression of trans people happens in our um, contemporary society? And it's important to note that in this essay, Feinberg is very comfortable with getting personal, right? Feinberg described being born in a kind of um, uh, uh, they describe it as feminine embodiment, right? They go through a process of transitioning, right? But then don't ever really feel comfortable with the idea of being a man either, right? And so Feinberg, the acceptable pronouns for Feinberg, I would use they and them to signal gender neutral pronouns. If you're comfortable with neo pronouns, um, Feinberg also mentions Z in here, right? And then also Feinberg, this is a practice that I think was more common in the 90s. It would be less common to use this sort of formulation now, right? But uh, Feinberg refers to themselves as uh, 
he she right or she he right um, to indicate sort of the ambivalence of their gender presentation right so if we just try to stick to one of these um, you know the easiest one I think the one that is sort of most that used to for us is they them um, so I would recommend that right and so what I want to really bring out of the Feinberg essay speech really is that Feinberg conceives of gender and sex presentation right as a kind of existential project right in other words when you decide to live out your life right one of the things that you decide on in some way is how you are going to fit in right to the existing um uh, society including its sort of sex gender schema right and Feinberger points out that whenever for whatever reason you don't really fit into um the normatively enforced categories right that you can die and that you can suffer extreme forms of oppression and injustice right leslie feinberg describes um almost dying in a hospital after being turned away um for care because they were essentially sort of like called a freak right um there are many cases where um trans people are murdered um essentially for their trans identity right for the fact that they don't fit into the existing um you know societally accepted sex gender system right and those things continue to today right um and so Feinberg is trying to make the case for uh, a transgender liberation movement right but one that is based in essentially as i've written here universal struggle right and what does that mean well feinberg points out that if you are cisgender which just means if you know um your gender essentially fits with the gender that was assigned to you right that you have reason to think about this struggle as being important to your own well-being as well right and why is that well because feinberg says that the expectations that are put on us for our gender or our sex or whatever right that they are straight jacket for the freedom of expression right and that's true like you're held to um the normative expectations uh certain kinds of gender presentations right even if you are cisgender right even if you're straight and cisgender and you feel comfortable within those categories to some extent right there are always going to be certain aspects of what it means to fulfill that role at least for other people that are going to grate against you right that their conception say of masculinity or whatever does not cohere with your own conception of what that means right and so in the same way that trans people are punished on the basis of the fact that they don't meet other people's gender or sex expectations right so too you are also punished on that basis right and i you know feinberg presents this as a relatively universal phenomenon right I, I think that almost everyone has felt at some point in their life that um the sex or gender that is associated with them just doesn't fit or doesn't fit fully right um at least maybe someone else's conception of what is involved with that doesn't fit you right and so in one way or another right we are all subject to the policing of gender and sex right even if you meet the existing standards right they always have the possibility of changing 
right? And so if you live in a society that essentially, you know, um, oppresses people on the basis of their gender or sex presentation, then even if you are in the group that, you know, is deemed acceptable for the moment, right, this still functions as a straitjacket on your freedom, right? And think about how closely your own freedom is related to the freedom of those closest to you around you, right? Like, even if you are cisgender and you're very happy with being cisgender, right, there are probably people in your life that you care about that are less happy with that, right? And insofar as your own freedom, right, is related to your ability to be a mother or a father or a friend or a brother, a sister, a cousin, a teacher, right, whatever, right? then your social identity, right, is somehow tied with the ability of other people to live out their lives, right, to make the decisions that you do not agree with, right, or that you would not uh, choose for yourself, right? And so what's, to me, very interesting about Leslie Feinberg is that there's a tendency, you know, in our own sort of like contemporary political moment, right? To think about like, um, you know, the struggle of black Americans, for example, as being something that solely belongs to them, right? And something that is their own political responsibility or something. And similarly, right? Um, I think that there's this sort of idea, right? That sort of uh, is around the contemporary uh, ethos or something like that, an idea that circulates, it's like, oh, well, if you're cis, then you shouldn't really participate fully or really or something like that in uh, the trans liberation movement, right? And if you look at figures like Martin Luther King Jr., if you look at figures like Feinberg, they emphatically disagree with that perspective, right? I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. is very clear, right? Where injustice festers, right? That's a threat to justice everywhere, right? And so there is essentially no freedom for any one person unless there is guaranteed freedom essentially for everyone, right? And so similarly for Feinberg, like, you know, the point of the trans liberation movement is not for everyone to be trans or to look trans or for the only people involved to be trans or something like that, right? But to defend the gender freedoms, essentially, of everyone, right? Everyone engages in the project of living out a life as some kind of gender identity, right? There, there's some way that you fit in with um, existing system of social responsibilities, right? But whereas now I think that we tend to think of that as very privatized, as almost like my property or something like that, right? King and Feinberg, that could not be farther from their own conception, right? From their conception, what's going on is not the, the idiosyncratic struggles of a particular group of people, right? No, it's the ongoing and continuous struggle for justice that prevails for everyone and is in the interest of everyone, right? And so then by definition could never be the sort of like personal property of a single group, right? And so Feinberg does not just see the transgender liberation movement as terminating in, say, the societal acceptance of people transitioning or, you know, the elimination of laws that discriminate against transgender people, right? In the same way that I have a broad commitment, right, to the freedoms of people to live out a certain kind of gender presentation, right, a certain gender identity, that robust conception of freedom, 
that can guarantee that, right, then plays an essential political role in my relationship to other struggles, right? And this is why King and Feinberg saw their own struggles as being universal, right? Even though they dealt with the oppression of black Americans, right? Or they dealt with the oppression of trans and intersex people, right? In all of those cases, what's happening is sort of the erosion of genuine freedom, right? Genuine emancipation, which cannot be sort of taken away at a moment's notice because someone else does not approve, right? That's been sort of the essential sort of thesis of this class in many ways, is sort of thinking about the political rebelliousness of a figure like Socrates and really thinking through what the consequences of that are for philosophy, right? And so, I would propose that Feinberg is promoting, proposing the transgender liberation movement as being a genuine kind of humanism, right? Like in the words of Jean-Paul Sartre, right? That it is a robust notion, right, of what it means to live in a free society or something like that, right, in one that involves very substantial and particular political commitments and responsibilities, right. At one point, Feinberg says something to the effect of, um, you know, the, the, the ultimate aim of the transgender liberation movement is the freedom of everyone, right? And that robust conception of freedom, that is what is at the core of, you know, the activist movements that I think that we can see in King and that we can see in some ways in Sartre and that we can see in the Feinberg, right? A very substantial notion, a very robust notion, a thick notion of political freedom, right, that involves a number of substantial commitments, right. And so we've written here four words that we're going to talk more about in the next video because they represent sort of like maybe spaces where our own existing gender and sex system these are people that exist at the margins of this system or are erased by this system in one capacity for another or another, right? So I've written here queer, right? Which has sort of become a, a catch-all term for describing deviations in sexuality, right? Next video, we're going to be talking about sexual object choice, right? And that is sort of what is essentially at stake here. Then we have these two related categories, transsexual and transgender. Um, typically, both of these categories are used to refer to someone who wants to live out a gender or sex that is not the one that they were given at birth, right? Um, and there are some important political differences, but we can't really get into that for now. And then I also wanted to highlight um, a phenomenon that I think many people often forget about, which is intersexuality, which is, you know, we often sort of default to this assumption that people are born with an unambiguous sex, right? That sex is something that we can determine as being true or false in each individual case. And uh, that's essentially what a doctor does, right? But the truth is that most people have sort of ambiguous, or not most people, but many people have ambiguous sex characteristics that make it difficult or impossible or arbitrary to simply assign, right, being a man or being a woman, you know, to that person, right? And this is something that Feinberg discussed as well with the difficulty of simply signing M or F, right? And so we're going to continue to discuss the, sort of these gender and sexuality identities that somehow do not mesh entirely with our own, you know, existing sex and gender system.
Okay, I hope that um, you enjoyed that video, and I hope that you enjoy the next one too. I hope you have a great week. Bye.